I want to introduce the first speaker this morning, uh, Paddy Duffy, <coughs> plays of, of Minute. Uh, I'm now a resident, of course, here <coughs> in Mayo. I've known Paddy for quite a while, and I find it very interesting that the first talk this morning should be about I find it very interesting that the first talk this morning should be about maps, because I feel it's one of the most important things is to know where we are, you know? And I always remember something, and I, 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 I'm going to attribute it to Paddy, I'm not sure, but I'm going to attribute it to him anyway. If somebody said to me one time, it to him anyway, if somebody said to me one time, stop looking at the map and start reading the map. And I think, wow, that is a lesson for us. You read maps, you don't look at them. You might look at a picture, but you read the map. So without any further ado, Thanks. I'll hand over to Paddy Duffy. Thanks, and Joe. That Paddy Duffy will be do you think so? I mean, okay. uh, no. Yeah, if you can't see, stand up. Yeah, I think so. I think we should read it. I mean, okay. the screen is a bit small, so it's a little bit difficult. We were going to move the seats forward, but I think it's just too, too difficult at this stage. But um, just thanks everybody for coming out um, on such a wild morning. You made there, Joe. You didn't attribute it to me because oh. I, I didn't say it. So. <laughs> and it's a good one anyway, you know. So I. I should have said it. But, so I'm going to talk about maps uh, over the last few hundred, 400 years. <coughs> I've said 400 years because roughly that's, I'm going to start with, with some early maps uh, of Mayo and then I'm going to finish with some swine. 400 years is just a kind of a fairly loose uh, reference. Uh, so, I mean, um, I suppose uh, as all good historians, I'm not an historian, but, but historians are fond of, I'm a historical geographer, so that's why I'm interested in maps. But historians are fond of phases and eras and all that kind of stuff. You know? so I reckon there's about maybe three, four uh, phases in the mapping of Ireland, really, and Mayo. I, I should say that because I'm not originally from Mayo, I'm kind of a bit lost in Mayo, even though I've been here, coming here for years and years. <coughs> I'm a bit, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not that familiar with it, so I had to dig around a bit to get examples of the maps. Uh, and I'm, so I'm kind of <coughs> around a bit to get examples of the maps. Uh, and I'm, so I'm kind of. Looking at Ireland and then focusing in on Mayo as a as a sort of an exemplar of the kind of things I'm talking about in terms of maps. The first phase, 1500s, 1600s, maps as, as instruments of colonial conquest, conquest by the state, by the crown. Uh, so that's the first phase. So the, the, the government, the state, was involved in investing in surveys and maps and so on to to to. Uh, to find out about the country. And then the second phase is where the, where the state and the crown and the pub, public investment kind of pulled back. Much of the mapping was carried out by, by private investment, by landlords, landowners, by estates. And then the, the third phase was mainly the 19th century, uh, where you had the state moving in again in a big way. I suppose, what's the term to use now? Big state or big government kind of moves in. Uh, the imperial parliament, the imperial parliament moves in and starts, starts uh, managing and, impo and mapping the country very intensively. So that's what we're going to look at, basically. So the first phase uh, is then the... Uh, I'm just going to get it up. Let's get out my notes here. The I'm just going to get it up. Let's get out my notes here. The first phase is... Well, first of all, I should say the pre-mapping phase. Medieval, medieval Ireland uh, didn't have any maps. Medieval Mayo didn't have any maps. I've referred to it as map, medieval mapless Mayo. It kind of has a bit of a ring to it. Medieval mapless Mayo, because lords and so on <coughs> in the west and in, in the west of Ireland generally and the northwest and Ulster and so on, didn't have any use for maps because they knew their country, they knew their land, they knew where, who lived where and they didn't have any reason to map. It was the, when the outsiders came in, when the British state, when the British crown in the west and the north and Ulster and so on, that's, that's when they needed, uh, they needed to know the country. They needed to find out about where everybody was and where, where the lords were, where the boundaries were, where the, the mountains were, and so on and so forth. So, so the example uh, that I have here is this quote, used so often, it's, that I have here is this quote, used so often, it's, it's, Worth, worth repeating. Uh, uh, Sir John Davies, who was the Attorney General for Ireland at the end of the, at the uh, beginning of the 17th century, uh, so it's a bit late. I'm going back after this, but 
he, he had this statement about, uh, so it's a bit late, I'm going back after this, but he, he had this statement about the survey, the Bodley survey for Ulster, so it's not in Mayo, but the Bod when he, he wanted this survey carried out in Ulster before the plantation in 1609. And he has this particular reference here. He said that, that this survey shall allow his mouth, we, he know, we know all the passages, we've penetrated every thicket, we've taken notice of every notorious tree or bush, all of which will not only remain in our knowledge and memory during this age, but being found by inquisitions of records and drawn into cards and maps, are discovered and laid up in map archive. He's saying we're going to win, we're going to send this guy in to do a survey, make a map of the place, and it's going to be there forever. In, and in fact, in London and in the archives in London, that's, that's where the maps, a lot of them ended up at this stage. So maps were, were tools of knowledge and tools of, as expressed here by Sir John Davies. So the state, the crown, government involvement in, our, in, in, in recording and making inventories of landscape resources, uh, marking boundaries later on in, in the early 17th century, this all be, these all become uh, conquest and tools of uh, civil administration. Uh, and, of course, as we see looking at some of the maps, early maps of Mayo, uh, the, the objective was to eliminate or obliterate the, all the, the old cultures and the old uh, customs and the old society, really, and it turns on the old uh, customs and the old society, really. And it, I suppose the ultimate expression of that was uh, plantation and the removal of the Gaelic lords and Gaelic ownership. So, as, so a lot of the maps then were interested, were interested in, in, uh, in uh, you know, mapping the mountains, mapping the forests, the woodlands, the fastnesses, as they were called at the time, uh, the woodland, the forest, the rivers and streams, which had uh, economic potential, for instance. Uh, uh, and also, of course, mapping uh, and churches and stone buildings and so on, which could be useful <laughs> for military purposes. Uh, and then mapping wasteland and bogland and arable land. Those were the, the priorities involved in the mapping. So here we have, the first one here on the left is Robert Lyth, who came here. Uh, Robert Lyth came over from England 1567 to 71, and he spent, he spent those three, three years basically doing field work in Ireland with a horse, uh, and a couple of servants. He went around the whole country, and you can see that this part of the country is, was fairly well covered by Lyth. Uh, the coastland, all the ports and so on were mapped. Lyth, uh, the coastland, all the ports and so on were mapped. But the, the place that wasn't mapped so much was from here, from Killary up to Strangford, roughly, the, across here. The whole north and northwest is a blank, pretty much a what, what, what they call a tabula rasa in many ways. So Robert Lyons, but it was, it was an amazing three years. I mean, he spent, uh, as I said, with, with horses and a few servants and uh, going around the country with, a, with local guides telling him the name, who give him the names of the places. On this map here, which you can't, this is a, 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 a detail from uh, just south of Killary. Uh, so it's, um, this is the part going down towards Connemara. And unfortunately, when you go uh, north of here, of uh, Hillary, we're into Mayo, so he didn't get in there because it was too hostile, it was too wet <laughs> and windy and, and uh, un un an uncomfortable place for him to go, uh, and he stopped there. He does here, I mean, if, if, if you could see this uh, for, for this area, you're all familiar with it, of course. He has the islands, for example, there's Inish Boffin, Inish Turk, uh, in his sock, I think it is. And there's one interesting here called Ard Ardalon, Ardalon, the High Island, you know? Yes, yeah, so, so Henry, you would know. Uh, the, the, this is the one, I borrowed this because it's uh, entertaining as much as anything else, where he obviously picked up the names from the local guides and tried to transcribe them or write them in phonetically. <coughs> and this is called, uh, oh God, I can't even read myself here. Uh, he has written the Irish Mahara, uh, Mahara. Uh, he has written the Irish Mahara, uh, Mahara Jalan, I think it's called. And then he has it translated in English, Devil's Bollocks. <laughs> Interesting terminology for, for, uh, for 1560. 1560 and, that, that, and then he has 
uh, beside the great twelve great mountains, the twelve bands. Uh, beside the great twelve great mountains, the twelve bands. Uh, so and so on. And the, the Killery is here. Uh, it's called um, Red Water. Red Water, which uh, I was. I've been told the the Irish for Killery is Kailara Rua, the Red Inlet. It's it's, a, it's an amazing kind of. Unfortunately, though, the sad story is he didn't get to into Mayo. And so we have nothing to say about that. So, uh, okay, uh, yeah. I was saying to somebody earlier on, I, I, I retired 10 years ago and I've got out of practice here in terms of uh, giving, like, and, uh, you know, coping with slides and, and, and a script. Um, Robert Lyoth, yeah. <coughs> then we have, okay, so, so blank, blank art, this is, this part of Ireland is fairly well covered up here. Mail and so on is pretty uh, inaccurate, as you can see there. Maps of Ireland, MacArthur and Speed, John Speed, famous cartographer from the early 17th century. And their maps, general maps, these are general maps that we use, but again, for Mayo and for the North generally, they're pretty inaccurate because they, 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 you can see that it was terra incognita. I mean, the whole Connemara, the whole uh, is inaccurately mapped, the actual coastline. In fact, I think, I think that may have been the reason why a lot of the Spanish ships ended up, uh, you know, a shipwrecked on the west coast, because a lot of they, they were depending on general maps like this at the time. I mean, they would have purchased the English maps, and, they were, and so the, 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 the ships went up over the English maps. And, they were, and so the, 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 the ships went up over Scot around north of Scotland and down, and I think the instruction was to sail west for a certain number of leagues and then uh, turn directly south because they'd avoid Ireland and come right back down to Spain. But in fact, a lot of them crashed into the west coast because they crashed into the west coast because they miscalculated or based on the inaccurate maps. So those maps there are not, are not really very. And then you can see here, comparing line and Brown, then you can see that Brown, John Brown then comes in and he starts producing maps in the 15th century. John Brown's map of Connacht uh, is much more accurate, in fact, uh, and compared with Lyle, the whole bit is missing here. So anyway, we won't, we won't, uh, we won't go on about that. Uh, John Brown's map first, this is the first reasonably good map of uh, Mayo. Uh, and this is one of those maps that, this is the map now, the colonial map basically, laying out the territory for, uh, for exposure to uh, the crown and the state. And here we have well, uh, the forest, the wood crown and the state. And here we have well, uh, the forest, the woodlands are all marked, obstacles to movement and military movement and so on. The woodlands. The mountains, of course, are, are, are represented as far as possible. The, the, the wasteland or the bogland is kind of generally coloured in and green, uh, and then all the uh, and then all the uh, strategic buildings, uh, you know, castles, churches, and stone buildings, and so on, are, and, and you know the the embryonic settlement of towns. And here they are; they're all marked in mapped in, and little black dots representing the headquarters of the different uh, That's Brown's map, 1591. <coughs> and that was followed by, uh, well, there were two Browns, John Brown the first and John Brown the second, and his uncle and nephew. And these Brown, the, the second uh, Brown was, ended up, I think he was, he, he came from, uh, he came originally from uh, West Mormon uh, family, came into, in, was, appoint, was appointed by Richard Bingham, who was the governor of Connacht, a notorious uh, personality, uh, who was, you know, the governor of Connacht, who was a classic example of a colonial, uh, military, uh, uh, you know, incomer who was determined to Gaelic culture, uh, you know, subjugate the Gaelic lords and, and make, incorporate this place into the new, uh, modernizing, emerging state of uh, Britain. Uh, so, so, and he employed Brown, the first Brown to come in and do the map of Connacht for, for reasons, strategic reasons, to know that the nephew uh, who lived in the Neil, apparently, and who was possibly, a, and probably, is, I, I believe, an ancestor of the Browns, Lord Sligo, Westport Brown, subsequently. Okay, so Brown, 
I, and Brown became the sheriff in 1583 and settled in the Neil and uh, the history of history of maps in Ireland. John Andrews from from Trinity College originally. Uh, um, he said that Brown is the first map to use the county as a unit. The county, the county was used as a unit in England. England. So you had maps of the English counties. In Ireland, there were no counties in England. England. So you had maps of the English counties. In Ireland, there were no counties until the, the, the gradual incorporation of, of the, the country into the, into the British state. So you had counties and sheriffs appointed to impose common law and all that kind of thing. So Brown actually mapped the county my own, and uh, Andrew says it was the first example of this. He mapped the county my own, and uh, Andrew says it was the first example of this, uh, of this uh, uh, approach to mapping uh, Ireland in terms of using the county as a mapping unit, yeah, the earliest in terms of He also suggests that Brown probably used proper surveying instruments because the shape, the general, that Brown probably used proper surveying instruments because the shape, the general plan and so on of the area is quite, quite accurate. Uh, and then, uh, so the next, uh, moving on from Brown, I just flashed the reason for you. The Down Survey, that's the reason for you. The Down Survey, there's a number of maps in Brown, and there was another guy called Grafton who, who, who did uh, some maps of Mayo as well. But moving forward to the 1650s, to the, the Down Survey by Sir William Petty, and this is a big, uh, the big sort of colonial. Uh, Petty, this, this is a copy of the, of, uh, the map of Mayo, uh, that it's the, the copy that was found in the Bibliotheque Nassau in Paris. The, the whole set of, of the Down Survey maps were being shipped over to England, over to London, and they were, they were intercepted by French pirates, by French uh, privateers, and, and the maps were taken to Paris. And fortunately, they survived and they've been kept there. And there so the original uh, down survey is available there. You can see it's up. We look at it in detail now. Um, it's uh, it's a very valuable uh, source. So this was this was Petty's great map. All the territories. So it was a kind of a map of territorial structure, you know. Because before that, it was, this was a big puzzle for for the British uh, uh, authorities, trying to get to grips with the nature of of Gaelic terri territories. And territorial structure, lordships. So, focusing in on the on the Clue Bay area here in Dun, in the Petty Survey, you have all the islands, you know, fairly fairly usefully marked. And then these are all the and the mountains are represented. And uh, and then the borders, the boundaries of the counties, and the boundaries of the barons of many of the, what we call today townlands. Many of the townlands are, mar are marked in by name. And in 1680, then, uh, Petty produced this uh, atlas of, of Ireland, uh, which is basically, he simply did a compilation of all his, a compilation of all his county maps and put them in, and this is County Mayo, and all, you can't see it at all in detail, but these are all the townlands, and, you know, they're there, if you look, if you compare it with the map of townlands today, it, it's very accurate. The boundaries aren't included, just the names of the townlands are dropped in, and that, so that is important. That is an important um, again, and that, so that is important. That is an important. Um, uh, so, so, so Petty. I mean, Willie Smith, uh, who was professor of geography in Cork, described uh, Petty as a genius who who facilitated the final reorganisation of Ireland, conquered Ireland, basically. Facilitated the final reorganisation of Ireland, conquered Ireland, basically, uh, and got it ready for a plantation and settlement. He said, what's the, uh, Petty was a medical physician, in fact. But he had a lot of other talents as well. And Smith suggests that he had, by the, by the time he was finished the survey in the, in the mid, and Smith suggests that he had, by the, by the time he was finished the survey in the, in the mid 1650s, Ireland was like a dead body ready for a kind of anatomical carving up by instruments of survey, or cutting up into new pieces for replanting and nurturing. And that's what he did in Cromwellian settlement, Cromwellian plantation on, on the, the accuracy <coughs> of petty surveys. The down surveys, here it is again, with all the hills and mountains represented. Unfortunately, the parish maps 
uh, are not available. They were lost. The parish maps for, uh, for Mayo were lost. So many other counties have it. And then the parishes are really varied. So, so there are detailed maps of the parishes showing buildings and, and lots of, all sorts of detail about the landscape in the 1650s. But unfortunately, when you, when you, zoom, when you zoom in on the, this is all online, when you zoom in on the petty surveys, in fact, a, a, a signal comes up saying parish maps, not enough. I must say, because the parish maps are, are the, the, you know, the gold standard. So, um, yeah, yeah, so when, when the petty survey was finished, the state withdrew, you know, the government withdrew from any further involvement in, in surveys and mapping. Six, seventeen fifty, well, really for 150 years, um, the John survey, Petty's John survey, remained the, the, the fundamental map and survey for Irish, for the Irish economy, for Irish land ownership, for anything to do with land, with revenue collecting, assess, all that stuff, and valuation was all based on the 1650 survey by Petty. The government didn't get involved anymore, so that's why we move into the, the second phase, which is the phase of more private investment, when the state withdrew uh, into the background and didn't get involved anymore. The, you know, the surveyor general and the, those kind of offices became redundant uh, 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 by the state, so the state didn't invest in any of it, didn't put any money into this. So. The, age, the 18th century mainly was, as, was it the age of private investment, private service, private mapping, as I said at the beginning, by the landowners, by the estates. So, as I said at the beginning, by the landowners, by the estates. So you get the most important uh, source of, for maps in the 18th century then are, are uh, estate maps. Uh, actually, I put this up, Joe, because this is a map by Pratt. Uh, this is Pratt's map of, of Connop by Pratt. <laughs> uh, this is Pratt's map of, of Connop, 1705. I, I don't, I assume there's no connection with Newport, but, but in any case, 1705. But yeah, so that was a, a map of May of 1705, but it's basically a down survey. I mean, all he did was put a few coloured things in and added in roads. I think the roads are, the emerging, put a few coloured things in and added in roads. I think the roads are, the emerging road system is, is put into this map. But other than that, it's, it's just, it's just a, a copy, basically, of uh, Petty's Down Survey. Uh, so, the, the, the 18th century, then, the, the, the period of the estate system, the landor, 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 landowning gentry start getting involved. The landowning gentry who had, been, who had purchased or been awarded uh, land estates in Ireland from the Cromwellian settlement and from the Williamite period, the end of the uh, 17th century, so those estates uh, uh, in the 18th century interested in their property and interested in developing their property and one of the things they had to do then was carry out surveys and do and construct maps of their estates. So you get the estate map. I just put these photo, these paintings and this is a painting by, jo by uh, uh, George Moore of, of Westport in 1760 and, 60, and James Arthur O'Connor at Westport Quay in about 18... 16, 18, 19. So they're just examples of the sudden, the big interest that landowners had in their properties in the 18th century. Uh, landowners were interested in getting paintings done. They were interested in getting uh, getting paintings done. They were interested in getting uh, getting uh, houses built, mansion houses built on their estates. They were interested in getting their domains developed, their parkland developed, and they were interested in getting maps of their estates and uh, estate surveys. So the landowners, the bigger ones especially, commissioned uh, surveyors and cartographers to come in and map their properties. Now, the, the, the best and the earliest examples of all this happened in the East, not in the West. Uh, the, the, the East was where you had the fat land, the rich land, uh, the land where you had an, a, you know, the, and make the land productive and useful and so on. So, th so therefore you find like the Kildare Estates, uh, this is not uh, big cartographers like John Roke, uh, Bernard Scalley, in this case Matthew Wren, who worked for John Roke, they produced these beautiful maps of the estates. This is the Kildare Estate. Uh, the, uh, it's like a work of art really. 
you know, it's, a, it's a, an almost bird's eye view of the, the fields and the hedges and the tree plantations and the different land uses and the fields, you know, arable grassland and so on, and all sorts of artistic stuff around it. So there were loads and loads of these done by the big wealthy landowners. It was later, happened later in the West where the land was, was, was poorer and there wasn't as much incentive to, to make it economically productive. Uh, okay, so, but there are examples, uh, well, there's only one example that I could find is in, 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 uh, in the Castle Bar Library, County Library, uh, the Lynch Bloss Castle Bar Library, County Library, uh, the Lynch Bloss Estate, and I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, that's another example from Galway, the Clon, Clonbrock Estate in Galway. Uh, it's very artistic as well, so that, but that's quite late, that's early 19th century. And then we move into the Lynch Bloss maps, which some people early 19th century. And then we move into the Lynch Bloss maps, which some people are probably familiar with these. Uh, near uh, Baal, that part of Mayo, down there somewhere in the southwest, you know. So the Lynch Bloss, so the, 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 these are, the, these are the, the estate maps, and they're, so they're eight. These are, the, these are the, the estate maps, and they're, so there are eight, no, the, um, the county library has them down as 1830, 1830, but I think I've seen other references saying more like 1818, 1811, you know, that's about 20 years earlier, but they're, but they're, the suspicion is as well, although it's not definite, the suspicion is that the maps were produced by William Ball. William Ball, who was, I'll talk about him in a moment, because he produced the big county map of Mayo, uh, a Scotsman, who came, a Scottish engineer who came over uh, in, the, in the early uh, 90s to produce a county map of Mayo by the grand jury, the grand jury map of Mayo. And then at the same time, he, was, he also got a sideline to, to produce maps for the Boggs Commission, surveys of the Boggs of, of Mayo. Uh, so, but it's suspected and it's probably highly likely that because he was on the spot okay, to produce maps of their land and that's why I put this up here because it's, it shows you more or less the kind of thing that was involved in, in, in these estate maps. Uh, you have the, you know you have the attempt to represent the trees and the hedging and so on that's just beginning to emerge. But in fact in the West this would have been much more common in just until it were appeared much earlier in the 18th century, much later over in Mayo. But they begin to appear, themes are beginning to appear, and he also has coloured in, as you can see here, the different things that are going on in the fields, and a, an attempt to represent, you know, arable land, uh, an attempt to represent grain growing, or whatever. I'm interested in the actual, uh, it, the detail on settlement, on the houses. So the houses are represented with little, little uh, red rectangles there, and here we are with gardens and so on around them. And th that, that's very useful because uh, 1810, 18, early 19th century, and then uh, Kilcolman. Uh, there's three cross sections here of, of, a, of a settlement, a hamlet, really. Some people call them villages, but they're not really villages because most, we, we tend to think of villages as places with, with a church spire and, you know, a green and a, 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 with a church spire and, you know, a green and a maybe a, a slightly uh, organized street system but here these are just clusters of houses uh, higgly piggly is the best description higgly piggly houses uh, with gardens and so on around them. organized street system but here these are just clusters of houses uh, higgly piggly is the best description higgly piggly houses uh, with gardens and so on around them. But there's three, three sequences here. The first one is from Ball's county map, the grand jury map, the jury map. The grand jury map of Mayo, which I'm going to show, I should have brought that up earlier. Uh, and it has the detail here of this cluster, but you can see it's just impressionistic. He obviously, he had, he, his surveyors just, just went around and they kind of counted, you know, there's 20 houses and they put in 20 little dots. And then later for the estate, has them plotted in accurately with the with the with the roadways and the boreens and all the little connections and the gardens and so on and on. And then in, in 1838, well the 1830s really, the Ordnance Survey, the official Ordnance Survey map, the same place in the Ordnance. So you've got a nice sequence of, of uh, 
No, I better, better move on. Um, okay, so I'll just run through these maps very quickly. These are more examples. Lynch Bloss, uh, Caramina, 18, 1813, but I think it's more, more likely it's 1811, actually. You know? Caramina with the village, with the settlement, the hamlet, I call it a hamlet rather than the village. 38, Ordnance Survey. The names slightly change. You can see, you know, the, the Ordnance Survey had a standard version of place names. So they, they stand, John O'Donovan was the, the place names scholar with the Ordnance Survey. He standardized the names. So before the Ordnance Survey, the names were a bit fluid and changing. So Caramina, but Car becomes Caram Caramuni, which may not be a genuine uh, reflection of the proper pronunciation of it. And then, th I just put this in here because this is showing something that I, I mentioned again, the lynch blocks, the striping of the land. So there you have Caramuni or Caramina, these big blocks and big, this big cluster of houses. Now, 1856, after the famine, happening all over Mayo, striping the land uh, into uh, rearranging, breaking up the, 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 the hamlets, breaking up the hamlets and replacing the fields, put, and building houses. In fact, you can't see it here, but basically what happened here was that the hamlet, is, in fact, you can't see it here, but basically what happened here was that the hamlet is, is, is broken up and individual houses are built with, the, with stripes, with the farm running back from the house. And that happened everywhere. There's loads and loads when you're driving through Mayo, uh, Galway, lots of this, uh, through Mayo, uh, Galway, lots of this uh, happening. And it all happened after the famine. Whereas it happened much, much earlier in the East, in, in places like Kildare and Meath and so on. You had this kind of reorganization took place way back uh, much earlier, but it, 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 it waited for the famine, the landlords got back uh, much earlier, but it, 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 it waited for the famine, the landlords got, got, a lot of them got frightened by the famine, clearly, and they decided they had to do something. And then, it, it, if they didn't do it, what happened was the congested district board did it later. So, uh, maps, again, uh, another, uh, knock, knock, knock on the new, or 18, well, 1830, 1811, Lynch Plus, there with the, with the hamlet, and then 1850s, the hamlet is gone. You can see the hamlet there, the cluster of houses there, they've all gone, they've been dispersed and replaced by squared up fields and so on. Okay, uh, look, that's, that's just a map of Mayo by, by Bernard Scalley, who was this famous, he was a great cartographer from uh, the end of the 18th century. and. Uh, in, in the east, in Kildare, you can got some maps of the Kildare Estates and Mead and other parts of the east down in uh, Kilkenny. But uh, this is an example of his, his map of mail. It's, it's an example of these cartographers doing a little uh, private job on the side. So he produced a, an atlas, or a, what's it called, a, a, an atlas of Ireland, uh, county by county, and this is the county of Mayo. It's just a generalised map of, of the county showing the, the, the baronies, the individual baronies in the county. And this is showing the, the, the baronies, the individual baronies in the county. And this, so the, I mentioned the Bogs Commission then. The early 1813, uh, the Bogs, uh, the government, the... Uh, and what we're doing now is we're, we're seeing an example here of uh, the state getting involved again. The state, after the Union, big government starts moving in, in, in Ireland. It starts commissioning, getting involved in development, economic incentives and so on. And one of the things they decided to do during the war, the Napoleon War, they decided to try and investigate the, the possibility of the bogs being reclaimed and so on. And, you know, growing crops. One of the, I think one of the things during the Napoleonic Wars was the possibility of growing flax in the bogs to produce uh, sails for the Navy during the war. But anyway, the bogs commissioned, so they commissioned a whole load of engineers. Edgeworth, uh, from Murray Edgeworth's father was involved, he was an engineer, he was involved in mapping the bogs up North Mayo, to be on the spot doing the county survey that I mentioned in the moment, the, the, the big county map for the grand jury. Uh, Ball was on the spot, so he was involved uh, to map the bogs of Mayo. And here you have, you know, so they're, they're, they're really interesting maps, they're very detailed. This is, um, this is, and then, you know, you know, if anybody knows, Bartra, who's there, and so on, Westport, and there you have all the bogs, very accurately mapped, and there's, there's some divided, they have actually calculating the extent of the bogs, and detailed lines were surveyed, mapped, <coughs> chains to mark out the boundaries, and, and chains to mark out 
the boundaries and, and map that and mark, calculate the extent involved in the area very accurately. Um, and that's Ball, Ball's kind of very impressive map. This is this area, well, west of here, this is Loch Daltra, is it? West of here, this is Loch Daltra, is it? Because you're coming to it, you know, around there, all the bottom there. You can see all, the, well, you can't see the lines. Mm -hmm. Just the lines are fascinating, the way they, they measure the, the extent of each bog. So, that's 1813. So, that's, that's a very useful... Uh, so, that's 1813. So, that's, that's a very useful uh, pre-famine source for the, the landscape in Mayo. It, it actually shows in, in fairly accurate detail the individual settlements. Do, do I have an example here? I don't. Uh, but it, it shows that those hamlets that I talked about, 1830. But it shows that those hamlets that I talked about, 1813. So you can come, Arnold Horner, the other, another geographer who's very interested in map history and written a lot about it, has done work comparing pre famine, you know, bog map, maps of, of the, the, the hamlets before the famine and maps of the hamlets after the famine that took place. They, this is the grand jury map, bits of the grand jury map that was commissioned. Uh, by the county grand jury, Mayo, and it's interesting to, to look at, at, at th this is an example now of, I would say, private uh, investment, private initiative, where um, that the estates, the landlords, and I'm thinking of Brown in Westport particularly, they had a tremendous, and Brown, it was a, Dennis Brown was an MP for 30 years, he was an MP in, in Dublin, in the Parliament of Dublin, and then in the Parliament, in the Imperial Parliament in Westminster, the ring, you know, with a massive interest in, in the local area and trying to, and, you know, competing with Newport and, and the other towns and trying to get Westport, you know, extra lobbying uh, Dublin, but particularly lobbying Westminster for funds to develop the key in Westport and so on and so forth. So, uh, so that's an example. Of, so I think Andrew and Gentry, 23 or 24 of them on the grand jury, and they would have had a pride in place, most of them, the ones who were resident anyway, would have been proud of their county and so on. So, so they were quite keen on getting, uh, getting the map, a map of the county. So this was a big thing. It started, it started, the first one was Dublin 1750, Armagh 1760, Wicklow 1760. This is the dates of the production of Grand Jury Maps. Carlow 1789. So you can see a pattern emerging. Galway and Leitrim and Sligo 1819. Roscommon, 1825, Mayo, the last one, 1830. So you can see the contrast between the East and West, and the West, see the contrast between the East and West, and the West coming out at the end, and, and getting the rack together, and getting commissioning, bald, to produce a map, 1830. It, although it took him, I think he had done a lot of the surveys, a lot of the survey work earlier on, but it took ages to get to actually get the map out. But it, it's a, it's being bald, to produce a map. It, although it took him, I think he had done a lot of the surveys, a lot of the survey work earlier on, but it took ages to get to actually get the map out. But it, it's a, it's very very deep. It was Clue Bay, all the islands, all highly accurate. Uh, just before uh, the Oregon survey, uh, and just before uh, the Oregon survey, uh, and it attempts you can see the mountains there, and there's this, there's this unique shading scheme where he tried to represent the, the, the height of the mountains, the cliffs and stuff. And he also tried to represent, you can even probably see the drumlands here. If you look, you can see the way he has mapped map the drumlands. Pretty accurately, shapes representing the drumlands. So that's Ball's map of, Ball's map of County Mayo. And another bit of here, I put this in for, uh, for, um, for Ryan. 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 <laughs> so, like, uh, NHT and uh, it's a hand-drawn, hand -drawn, coloured in version of a ball, it's not very attractive. Um, and then, I mean, the, the, you can do the comparison between the county, the grand jury map, and if you look at this ridge here, and it's, it's got a whole line of uh, hamlets, and then you have the same, same area, you can look at the line of hamlets here in the Oregon survey map, so that's just that's just an, inter an exercise that one can do. Uh, I just put this up, contrasted along for Lewisburg, the plan planned town of Lewisburg, you know, with the garden and nothing at all, 
with this big cluster of rundown, basically a cluster, they're essentially rundown settlements, where I should have explained that, but the cluster, these hamlets were rundown hamlets, rundown clusters, where uh, all the farmers, the landowners, landholders within the cluster had their land scattered across, scattered around in, in patches with tremendous amount of disputes and trespassing and all sorts of stuff going on, you know, you know the cows trampling the corn and this kind of stuff. So a lot of a lot of the a lot of things ended up in court, neighbours suing neighbours because of trespass and stuff. So that, that, that was part of the Rondale thing and of trespass and stuff. So that, that, that was part of the Rondale thing. And so that you can see the incentive then after the famine was to was to reform these settlements. And uh, apart from the fact that a lot of them got wiped out in the famine anyway, a lot of people died, etc. Uh, the landowner decided that the best thing to do was to strike the land. Uh, the landowner decided that the best thing to do was to strike the land and reorganise the settlement and solve all these problems of, of management and trespass. Okay, moving on to the next one. Yeah, I show this because this is a map of uh, Moor Hall. Moor Hall is here and uh, Moor Hall. Moor Hall is here and the, the, the estate you know, the Moor estate, and all the, it's part of, it's, well, this is the domain, and then we have the home farm, I suppose it would be called, but all the fields of names, and many of them are Irish names, uh, well, actually, that one there's, uh, well, actually, that one there's Long Meadow, uh, Commons, Bum Beg, uh, oh, I can't really read those, no, uh, but, and then, th that's interesting, the next one shows, Westport, Westport, Westport House is here, West and the Little Hill, but most of the fields have got names. In this case, most of them are English, English names, Park, etc., etc. But that's just interesting because that shows that the, the place name people who have been around the organ survey, the surveyors, uh, a lot of them were the, um, what do you call them, the, the name books, constructing the name books for the organ. There were army officers, there were uh, royal engineers, and there were English. A lot of them came from, you know, from Hampshire and places in England, the south of England, and they came over here, and they were, so they were, the best, the most comfortable surrounding they found was the big house, going to the mansion house. So the gent, the lords, the landlords, the gentry, going to the mansion house. So the gent, the lords, the landlords, the gentry, uh, would prevail <coughs> upon them, right, to put in the names on their fields, you know. And then when you get beyond the, the boundary of the, of the, the estate, you're into the into the, the peasant landscapes where they weren't really interested. They were just interested in mapping the farm run their farm run their clusters and, and that was it. So they, they were the fields. So it, it's only now in the last twenty years or so that we're beginning to collect the names of the fields and places are just covered with thousands of them. Thousands of these names. So there we have uh, that's so I, I checked um, Newport but I didn't see any field. Um, a few more places. Uh, Burr, for example, around the Burr, uh, Burr domain as well. The names are fields are named. Chosy, and also when you look when you look at the when you look at the is it enough of West Burr, no. all the the mansion houses, the gentry <coughs> mansion houses are all coloured in. The domain is coloured in. It's all they're obviously the elite. They were sufficiently important to be. To, to have make a mark on the map, and then when you go beyond the, the bounds of the domains and the estates, uh, nobody. And then when you go beyond Westport, we have not only the, uh, were the fields named, but a lot of the house names were recorded as well. So Westport has Westport has a whole going from Westport out is about I think about thirty houses, uh, you know, named uh, Clue Bay House, Marino Villa, Marino Villa. A lot of them have names like villas and lodge and so on. They were basically some of them were holiday places or shooting and fishing places. Uh, but they were be they belong to the sort of middle class. The, the, in this case, a lot of them were solicitors and land agents, people, important people associated with the estate. So their land agents, people, important people associated with the estate. So their houses were named. Uh, well, they had named them ho their houses themselves on the ordinary survey. Thought it sufficiently important to actually map them, so they were so. 
So you find that uh, in other parts of the country as well, Burr, for example. So you find that uh, in other parts of the country as well, Burr, for example, uh, the Liffey Valley is full of them. All the houses in the Liffey Valley, big farms, big tenant farmers uh, had their houses named and they're not the new one So that's uh, another version of mapping. Yeah, there's uh, there's the, another version of mapping. Yeah, there's uh, there's the gentry, there's Newport <coughs> and Newport ha House and the domain is ornamentally, you know, mapped in artistically, really, you know, like all of the, so that's a measure of the importance of these people in the eyes of the surveyors as they were going through. So, now, I put this, this is, so that, that was the, the ordnance survey then was, was the most important big development of the 19th century, but not just the ordnance survey, I'm, I'm just, the age of government surveys, you had the Bogs Commission, you had, soon, soon after that, the Geological Survey started producing maps, starting in the 1830s. And the ordinance, of, and that really was the, the big incentive for, for doing this detailed map of properties and boundaries and hedges and so on, fields and farms. The big incentive was taxation, that, to get pro a proper valuation of the land, because as I said, petty, probably obsolete in that day. So they needed a proper valuation of property, a proper property valuation, and, and indeed we still haven't got a proper, proper valuation in this country. But the, the Ordnance Survey was, was going to be the basis for that. So the six-inch maps from the 1830s produced a comprehensive record of all elements of the Irish landscape, all the boundaries, information on the culture landscape. Its maps uh, recorded the end result of a hundred years of change and development of the landscape just before the massive collapse of traumatisation and famine. But Thomas Larkham was a big name involved in the Ordnance Survey. Thomas Larkham and he was a classic example of a kind of Victorian survey, Thomas Larkham. And he was a classic example of a kind of Victorian encyclopedist. You know, he wanted to collect information on everything. I mean, and not only him, but loads of people at the time, the age of science and, and statistics. So collecting information, collecting data, as they call it today, was a big thing. And Larkham was a classic information, collecting data, as they call it today, was a big thing. And Larkham was a classic example of this. He, he, he got involved, he, he, he decided to, he started off that the Ordnance Survey was going to produce memoirs of every parish, a memoir of every parish with all sorts of stuff in it, the history of the parish, uh, population, health, uh, of the parish, uh, population, health, uh, I mean, just an amazing, but he only, it, it was so huge that the government just plugged on it and didn't fund any more of the government in Westminster. So there was only one, one memoir published, <coughs> Templemore and County Derry, and that's it. It's a big book. It's a big book with loads of stuff about the place in the uh, Templemore Parish in the 1830s. <coughs> uh, so he was also appointed Poor Law Commissioner to set up the workhouse, to organise the workhouse. He was appointed, he worked for the valuation, uh, he worked for the census. He was a big mover in the census survey map showing all those houses in detail. He wanted to, to use the map, the census enumerators, to actually use the map. It's a really modern idea, but it, that didn't work really. And also the police got the job in the country. The Railway Commission, he was involved in the Railway Commission, producing maps for that. So, as John Andrews said, so that was a, so the epitome of that century, really, mapping everything. Uh, <coughs> he was involved. He was also involved in the agriculture census. There was an agriculture census in 1847, and for about ten or so years after that, or indeed for decades after that, the 1870s. Uh, so, and he wanted to. He wanted to use the six-inch maps to undertake a field by field land use survey. You know, so he saw potatoes were the problem in the family. So let's just let, take this great map we have and send send, send surveyors up to shade in in every field, what's grown in the field, potato, what's grown in the field, potatoes, corn, oats, wheat, barley, whatever it is, and you'd have a, a land use survey, which we never did. We still couldn't do. I think they, done, they did it in Northern Ireland after the Second World War. Uh, they did it, got school teachers to work on that land use by field, field by field. So, uh, yeah, as John, by field, field by field. So, uh, yeah, as John, as John Andrews said, the Ordnance Survey offered an image of a rural Ireland that knew its place with an official church, the established church, uh, a settled class of landed gentry, 
in charge of everything, and uh, a well-ordered administrative high parish, uh, barony, Kola, Union, etc. Uh, so that was the order side of the very important. Uh, and, and then you had other, uh, all sorts of other involvements that, that use the map. Uh, the Board of Works, for example, uh, who were involved in building harbors and roads, of course, uh, because a lot of West Mayo wasn't, was roadless really before the famine. So the Board of Works uh, were involved in it. In fact, there's a, I, I, had, I was lucky to get access to a ledger, a, an account book from Malloy's of Westport uh, from 1860 to about 1890. Uh, from 1860 to about 1890. It's an amazing, huge ledger. Uh, and it, it, a, lot of, a lot of the accounts that Malloy's had were accounts uh, uh, just read the list of, of, of people that were involved. Um, that were involved. Um, accounts for the Board of Works. Yeah. Accounts were held for the for the Board of Guardians of the West of, of the workhouse. Okay. Accounts to fix the workhouse and buildings. Uh, bridges up and down the coast. I mean, the account is a kind of a, a record of the making of the landscape, of everything that was made, and all and that development of the landscape, I mean, the roads, the bridges, the, the lighthouse, the piers and harbours, the constabulary barracks, uh, the uh, at Westport to Ackland railway contract century for for roads, uh, mineral exploration company in the 1890s, relief works all over the country in the 18. Uh, in the eight, late 80s and 90s, when there was a virtual famine again in, in the West, uh, uh, the congested district board, all of these were using the Northern Survey map uh, in their works. And Malloy were using the Northern Survey map uh, in their works. And Malloy's record every crowbar, every sledgehammer, every wheelbarrow, uh, every piece of timber. Malloy's were big importers of iron and timber into the Westport Quay. And they, they had accounts going up going from Del Mullet right down to Connemara, uh, right down to Connemara, uh, supplying all these state agencies with, with, with stuff, with, with material. Uh, very, very important. Castlebar Lunatic Soil, for example, was also important. So, uh, just coming near the end, I just want to show you a last... No. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, that was ba based on the order of the administration in Dublin Castle to set up, uh, uh, well, to set up uh, you know, this welfare system, this workhouse system. So the country was divided up into poor law unions. The poor law unions were subdivided into electoral divisions. And the farmers and all the uh, taxpayers in the to organize the workhouse. So this is a map of the electoral divisions in Ireland. Uh, and there you have Mayo up there, some big ones up there in the northwest. <coughs> but, so that's a kind of a reflection of the administrative importance of maps and so on to actually organize society and organize the landscape. And then beside it, like underneath the electric bridge then, you have the townlands and there's about 1,900 in Monaghan, I'm sure there's about 3,000 or so in, in Mayo. <coughs> so, these, so you have all the hierarchy of, of spaces based on the Ordnance Survey maps that, are, that, that, that became possible. Map of, the, map of the population density. This is just a, these are just maps showing that these clusters of houses, uh, there, there it is Mayo, there's yeah. all the little red dots. <coughs> Huge numbers of them. And I know some people have said, I mean, Seamus Caulfield now, who is a uh, Mayo, uh, in, lives up in North Mayo, he has a, he argues that, single lives up in North Mayo, he has a, he argues that single house, you know, the single house, the bungalow, is just a, a continuation of, a, of a, an Irish uh, tradition, cultural tradition going back, I don't know, it's just 2,000 or more years, you know, that a single house was the single farmhouse was, or more years, you know, that a single house was the single farmhouse was, was the basic, and people should still be allowed to build single houses. And I mean, when you look at this, there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of clusters. People didn't live in single houses, they lived in these cluster hamlets in great numbers. And there, there they are, there. Uh, the Camlets, in great numbers. And there, there they are, there. Uh, and that's what, that's what they looked like then. That's one they're doing near, near, outside between Westport and Castlebar. Dune, 
cluster. There's about 30 houses in it, 30 families in that just before the famine in the 1830s. And then when you look at it, Burden is serving up in the 1890s. They're still in it. Totally gone. Totally disappeared from the landscape. And that, you can, that repeated itself all over and over, over and over again throughout Mayo. And that's what they looked like. That's what the cluster looked like. Uh, these are congested district board uh, photographs of, of house so, higgledy piggledy the gable in, uh, all thatched and so on. Everybody is posing here for the CDB inspector. Um, yeah. And finally, on Fair Island, striping then the reorganisation of the landscape and using the Ordnance Survey to arrange along the roads. And these are the, this is underneath you have the old pre uh, pre famine landscape of, of ridges. Ridges kind of higgledy piggledy around what the village was, was here. And these, these ridges were the, 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 allotted to each farmer, and they all had they could put in a clear iron. And then boundaries were drawn. Surveyors came in and drew up boundaries and mapped out a new landscape and a reorganized, tidier landscape uh, like that. You can see underneath, you can see the old previous higgledy piggledy landscape, and then, then the new, and drawn up by the land courts, landscape, and then, then the new, and drawn up by the land courts. The land, this is a, 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 the estate of Mary Brett, Kalimer Parish, County Mayo, and what the, what the, the court, what the, the, the judges did in the court did, they simply put in rectangular fields and straightened it all out. And they simply put in rectangular fields and straightened it all out. And so a lot of the fields that we, we see today with stone walls are quite recent, quite recent. And, fi and then finally, I just want to show you these couple of not say or place names, or field names, and minor names that you can use the the, the, the ordinance and minor names that you can use the the, the, the ordinance survey map. Uh, yeah, uh, you can use the ordinance survey map with all the fields outlined, right? and it's updated now. You can get a you can when you zoom in on the OS website, you can get you zoom in on the OS website, you can get an updated field map, field boundary map, and Bell Mullet, all these minor names can all be put in on Luganum, Luganum.ie is the, is the place name website, and there's actually a kind of a, what do you call it, a crowd funded, not crowd funded, but crowd, you put in the names of the fields that you've discovered around your house or around the parish, and I, this, these are ones that I collected here, and you can just, you, you can just put the little cursor over the field and then type in the name and where you got it and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's a, an updated kind of use of the map survey and, and a wartime map. And I, 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 unfortunately, I can't read. I, I zoomed in on part of Mayo. They did the whole country, but all they did was they took the six inch maps and they over to Southampton and they photographed them just in case Ireland was invaded, so they photographed the sixth map down into a, into a big compilation so they were able to highlight the places, strategic points and so on. So it was kind of an echo of the earlier 16th century uh, colonial uh, knowledge of the landscape. And this is the RAF, just in case, just in case uh, there was an invasion. And even after the war then, they had a, they, they, in the 1950s, the RAF had maps showing this is the Irish quarter inch map, and they, they were using it to, to highlight points of interest. Uh, and Arnold Horner, whom I'm, whose name I already mentioned, has, has written, done some research on the British Army's uh, military mapping in Northern Ireland during British Army's uh, military mapping in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. And uh, in fact, it's actually interesting to read uh, what he says, what, what they. Uh, he says what they, where is it? Uh, yeah. Uh, he says that, the, so what they were doing in Northern Ireland, 1970s, 1980s, during all the trouble in the North, uh, they needed maps to facilitate, uh, you know, to, to precise location things. Because uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, 1972, 73, uh, there was certainly was an anecdotal reference to an, in South Ireland saying, where are we, you know, where is this? And the mm -hmm. said, so it was, all he had was an SO map, road map, and he said, I haven't a clue, he had no idea where it was. So, so the, the army obviously de determined 
to get proper maps, so they, to get you know a good insight. So the map was was the maps were the map was was the maps were uh, to record places of concealment, woods in rural areas, and ruins or derelict buildings and towns. It's almost an echo of you know uh, 1560. Where, where, where Robert Lyon was coming in and he was mapping out the woods and so on, so that the, the fastnesses, Lyon was coming in and he was mapping out the woods and so on, so that the, the fastnesses, so that the, the soldiers coming in, the Elizabethans could see where they were. So we're doing that in the 1970s in Northern Ireland. So that's basically all I want. The, the last map, just to, 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 uh, to, to 400 years, I, I said map, maps over 400 years, May 2014 for, for Mayo. And a lot of this is done with satellite imagery and all sorts of technology. But it shows, in, this is the, the dark grey areas and bogs, the bog areas, and there is reasonably good land and all this sort of stuff. So it's a really, really, really detailed map of Venture. This is another one showing uh, Bay with the colours represent different soil types and different agri with different agricultural potential. So, there's a, so it's map, this mapping. Uh, geographical GIS, <coughs> geographical information systems, is the way now for mapping. So collecting data uh, on is the way now for mapping. So collecting data uh, on everything. And I have a son who works in Canada working for a company who's a GIS data scientist. And he, what he does is he's sitting in an office and he gets all the data from these ginormous farms in, the, in Canadian prairies, you know, showing us farms in, in Canadian prairies, you know, showing uh, soil temperature, soil depth, mineral content, uh, humidity, blah, blah, a whole load of data, and he puts it all in, and he produces a map then, which he puts on the US, which he sends out by email to the farmers, and they plug it into their combine harvesters, you know, it's just, I said to him, what about the birds and bees, and he said, birds and bees don't count in the prairies, you know, so, so that's the new mapping, GIS, geographical information. That's it, thank you.